session on obesity management, which is hosted by Doc Plexus in association with Center for Metabolic Surgery. Headed by Dr. Raman Goyal, CMS is amongst India's top bariatric surgery center and represents a comprehensive team of surgeons, physicians, dietitians, and psychologists to assist on weight loss surgeries. This in program includes the expert opinion of our guest lecture, uh, lecturers on their topics, along with patient testimonials and their experience about the treatment. I am very honored to be introducing our esteemed guest speaker for today. We'll be talking about obesity, which is a major risk factor for diabetes, hypertension, myocardial infarction, and degenerative osteoarthritis. So our speaker would be sharing light on the medical management of obesity. So we have with us today, Dr. Behram Pardiwala. After schooling in Kolkata, Dr. Pardiwala did his undergraduate and post-graduation from degrees uh, from Seth Medical College and KM Hospital, Mumbai. He is also a postgraduate teacher for medicine and is also a teacher for the Diplomat of National Board of Examination. Dr. Padiwala is associated with, associated with many prestigious hospitals in Bombay. And he has also been awarded with the Sandalhurst Gold Medal and Vasant Khanolkar Prize in, uh, when he was doing his MBBS. He is also the recipient of Bombay University Merit Scholarship and has been involved in a lot of CME teaching programs, international and national conferences. And he is also uh, enthusiastically participated in many teaching programs and has many publications and chapters to his credit. It's an honor for us to have you here, sir. I would now request you to please start your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. At the outset, let me thank Dr. Ron Goel and CMS and Dr. Texas for asking me to talk to you on this subject. My topic for today is obesity, the medical management of obesity. That is what I'm going to be primarily talking about. So, in the medical management of obesity, this is the problem that we face, ladies and gentlemen. The problem is that obesity runs in our family. Unfortunately, no. The problem is that no one runs in your family. That is a major issue. Obesity is one of the biggest threats among NCDs in India. And if you look at the prevalence of these, 46% is obesity, 33% hypertension, and 26% type 2 diabetes. This is among the non-communicable diseases. And unfortunately, obesity has already reached alarming pro proportions in many parts of our country. Look at this. In 2005 and 2006, we had three states which had a 15% overweight or obese population. In 2015-16, exactly 10 years later, ladies and gentlemen, 19 states had more than 15% overweight obese patients. That's a huge number in just 10 years. And you will be shocked to know that three out of four Indians are overweight. Yes, three out of four Indians are overweight. And obesity amongst Indian children is on the rise. Between 1990 and 2014, the number of overweight children in the low and middle income countries doubled from 7.5 to 15.5. And in 2014, 48% of obese children live in Asia. Can you imagine? And Indians between 5 and 19 are increasingly getting obesity, primarily, primarily because of a westernization of our diet. And according to a report, which was formed by the WHO, it has alarming consequences of blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, osteoporosis, and various other factors which you know about. So these are some of the morbid conditions which are related to obesity. You can get atherosclerosis, diabetes, polycystic ovarian disease, hirsutism, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, osteoarthritis, obstructive sleep apnea, restrictive lung disease, and also cancer, especially endometrial, colonic, prostate, and breast cancer. So you can understand 
that if you treat obesity, you would be getting rid of a lot of these problems. However, you must understand that weight loss will improve obesity-related complications only. If you want prevention of type 2 diabetes, then up to 10% weight loss is necessary. For remission of type 2 diabetes, up to 15% weight loss. For dyslipidemia, up to 15% weight loss. Hypertension, 5 to 15%. Non-alcoholic fatty liver, 5 to 15%. For obstructive sleep apnea, 10%. And for all the others, such as stress incontinence, psoriasis, gastroesophageal reflux, polycystic ovaries, asthma, etc., you need between 5 to 10 percent of weight reduction. You must understand why we start at 5 percent. It is because up to 5 percent weight loss can even occur with placebo. And that is what is extremely important for you to understand. What are the treatment options that we have? for treatment of obesity, diet and exercise, surgery, and medical. My job, ladies and gentlemen, is to talk to you about the medical aspects of treatment options. Basically, there are three mechanisms of action, three mechanisms for obesity medication. One is to decrease the food intake by reducing appetite or increasing satiety. The second is to decrease the absorption from the gut. And the third is an increase in energy expenditure. Unfortunately, the last, that is an increase in energy expenditure. Nowhere in the world, especially in the United States, has this been approved. No drug has been approved. For example, ephedrine, norepinephrine, etc. These are drugs which are used to increase energy expenditure. But under the law, you cannot use it. Unfortunately, and I say it very seriously, unfortunately, a lot of gyms, a lot of gym trainers are using this drug in mixed stress, especially one which is called rip fuel. And you will be shocked to know that I have lost a nephew of mine who inadvertently took rip fuel. Now, in the anti-obesity drug, you have the Zenical, which is Orlistat, Belvic, which is Locasserine, Contrire, which is Bupropion, Naltrioxone combination, Kismia, which is a fentanamine topiramate combination, Sexenda, which is Luraglutide, Dulaglutide, Sulicity, and of course, Semaglutide. And I shall discuss some of these with you a little bit, a little bit in detail. So looking at the pharmacological options for weight management, if you look at it on the left, you have orally stat, which you can see has been approved both in the European Union and in the United States. It acts by energy wastage. Fentyramine is not approved in the European Union, as is fentyramine and topiramate. That is also not approved in the European Union. Both of them act by appetite reduction. Naltrioxone and bupropion, liraglutide, which is sexanda, has been approved both in the European Union and the United States. But please remember, all of these are an adjunct to diet and physical activity for chronic weight management. Now, if as you can see on the right, fentanyl topiramate acts at the sorry, at the GABA receptors and also at the noradrenergic and the dopaminergic receptor, while liraglutide acts in the gut and in the thalamus at the GLP-1 receptor, naltrexone, bupropion, fenceribine all act at the dopaminergic receptors, and orlistat acts on, of course, the pancreatic lipase. So if you look at noradrenergic agent, fenceribine has no weight loss, less than 12 weeks. Fortunately, monotherapy has not been associated with valvular disease. But when fenfluramine was combined with fenfluramine, what was known as fenflur, at that time you had valvular disease occurring in the heart. But fenfluramine on its own does not cause anything, and that is why it has got approval. Phenylpropylamine 
has been approved as an over-the-counter appetite suppressant, but was withdrawn due to the risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So amongst the non adrenergic agents, you only have phentermine, which is available. Then you have the drugs which suppress appetite. And amongst the appetite suppressing medications are locaserine, which is a selective serotonin 2C receptor agonist. It increases weight loss from 2.2 to 5.8 kilograms compared with placebo. Unfortunately, as is the case with most of these medications, the weight returned to baseline after medication was stopped. It's been approved by the United States Food and Drug Authority since July 2012. And you can see from here the locaserine effectiveness. It's very beautiful and you can see that if you use it beyond one year also, that the effect continues. And what is beautifully seen here is this one. You can see that when you use it for one year, the weight loss is there. The moment you stop using it, you start gaining weight again. Then you have medications that reduce absorption. That is Orlisat, which is available abroad as Zenical. It binds the gastrointestinal lipases, preventing hydrolysis of dietary fat. So what happens is about one third of fat calories is excreted in the stools and patients lose about 9% of body weight. As I told you, 5% body weight loss is always and can always be attributed to placebo. This weight loss, which Orlistat gives, is associated with a decreased blood pressure and a decrease in fasting insulin levels. So it's extremely effective for patients who have a high insulin level or who are insulin resistant. Because it's, uh, it causes the fat to be lost, you should always take fat-soluble vitamins as daily vitamin supplements. Unfortunately, again, I repeat, once the medication is stopped, weight is regained. And you can see from here, this is a normal function. And this is what happens when you give early fat. The gastrointestinal lipase is blocked over here in the lower frame and triglycerides, et cetera, are all excreted in the stool. Then you have pentenamine topiramate combination, also called Kismia, which is approved by the US FDA in July 2012. Pentenamine reduces appetite and decreases oral intake, while topiramate is an appetite suppressant and a satiety enhancer, acting at the hypothalamus. It's given daily in the morning because it causes insomnia. And believe me, it causes insomnia. If you take it at night, you probably won't sleep the whole night. You normally start in a dose of 3.75, 23 for 40 days, and then you increase it to 7.5, 46, et cetera, up to 12 weeks. <clears throat> at 12 weeks, if you find that you have less than 3% weight loss, you have the choice of stopping it or going up further, provided that the insomnia is not too bad, if headache is not too bad, if nausea is not too bad, you can increase the dose even to 11.25 to 69. Again, after 12 weeks, you recheck. If there is less than 5% body weight loss, you should stop Kismia. However, if there's more, you can continue it. And this is exactly what is shown in this slide. You can see what happens as the dose increases and the body weight continues. This is up to 56 weight going right up to the end. And you can see the degree of weight loss when compared to placebo. Placebo is the blue one, and the pink one is 7.5, and the green one is 15 milligrams of phentermine. So just think that with an increase in dose, you have greater weight loss. There is a significant improvement with treatment. And not only does your weight go down, but so does your blood pressure, your lipid concentration, and your blood glucose levels. So it's a win-win situation. But unfortunately, there are certain risks such as nephrolithiasis, hypokalemia, dry mouth, paresthesia, constipation, and insomnia. And that is why in these patients, you need to keep extremely hydrated, right? These are some of the common side effects. Nephrolithiasis is something which we people are really worried about when you take Kismia. Then you have the combination of bupropion and naltrexone, which is Contral. It's a combination medicine which was approved in 2014. 
it was initially rejected because of cardiac problems in 2011, but later approved for adults with BMI of more than 30. It has to be given in conjunction with the weight loss program. In fact, I would not hesitate to say that all the drugs should be given in conjunction with the weight loss program. You should reevaluate at 12 weeks and it should be stopped if you have not got more than a 5% weight loss. Normally, the patients lose 4% more of body weight with medicine compared to placebo. So you're at about 9% total body weight loss. Nausea is seen in almost more than 30% of patients. More than one third of them complain of nausea. And you do get depression and a suicidal risk. It sometimes causes a rise in the blood pressure. You then have what is a GLP-1 analog, liraglutide, better known as Victoza, which you use for diabetes, where we step up the doses from 0 0.6 milligram to 1.2 to 1.8 in treatment of diabetes. This is a once a day injectable. However, when you use it at its license in the USA for weight loss, Sexenda is the name and patients lose 8% of body weight compared to 2.6% with placebo. I would like to emphasize here that Sexenda is not approved or liraglutide is not approved in the Indian subcontinent for weight loss. So three out of five patients using Sexenda lost more than 5% body weight and one out of three, that 33%, lost 10% of their body weight, which is really something which is remarkable. And here you can see beautifully the mean change in the body weight versus time. And you can see with the different doses, what happens and the degree of weight loss, the maximum being here with Sexanda, which is three milligrams of liraglutide. And again, another thing to show you a loss from 233 pounds to 208 pounds, a 25 pound weight loss over a period of 64 weeks which is substantial and it actually doesn't give much of side effect. The initial run-in period, you do get a little nausea, but if you build up the dose gradually of Sexenda, then there is no problem. Of, then you have the other GLP-1 analog, dulaglutide, which is Trulicity. It's again an injectable GLP-1 analog. It's a once a week injection compared to Victoza or Sexenda, which is daily. You get up to 7 to 8% weight loss. However, there are some super responders who even have had 20% body weight loss. However, I would like to emphasize here that liraglutide in most, almost all trials has proved superior to dulaglutide in reduction of weight. I would again like to emphasize here that even dulaglutide is not sold in India for reduction of body weight. It's not licensed for that. Neither dulaglutide nor liraglutide. So when you look at the pharmacological options for weight management, and you can see the status and the mode of action, which I have already described to you, you can see that the dosing for already start is three times a day. For fentanyl topiramate, it's once a day. For naltrioxone, bupropion, it's twice daily. And for the injection, it is a daily injection. All of them are as an adjunct to diet for obesity, including weight loss and maintenance. And if you look at the, again, if you look at it, the weight loss, which you can expect, 2.9% with all this, that 8.6% with fentanyl, 4.8% with naltrioxone, 5.4% with liraglutide. And over the longer term, if you look at it, it's 28 with all this, that and 4.2 with liraglutide. If you look at the percentage of patients who achieve more than 10%, 26% achieve that in only stat, 47% achieve it with fentanyl topiramate, and 25% with naltrioxone, and 33% with liraglutide. If you want 5% reduction, then almost all of them, look at that. Only stat gives you 54%, Fentanyl gives you 67%, naltrioxone, bupropion, 48%, and liraglutide, 63%. And you can get good maintenance of weight loss 
as compared to the treatment before. We then come to the newest kid on the block, the latest human GLP-1 analog, which is semaglutide. And semaglutide, a lot of studies have been done, step one, step two, step three, step four, etc. I would like to tell you that what I'm saying here is that semaglutide in any form is not yet marketed or available in India. Please understand that. It will be available very shortly, but as of today, it is not expected. And I have been strictly asked by Novo to emphasize that to you before using these slides. So if you look at the pharmacotherapy, you have look at that placebo 2.4% and 16.9% body weight change with oral semaglutide. February 2021, New England Journal of Medicine. This is a fantastic drug for weight reduction. With 2.4 milligrams, 86.4, 69.1, 50.5, and 32% had weight losses. 32% having a weight loss of more than 20. And if you increase the dose, it just keeps on, just keeps on going on. And it, and, and it, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, you have to see what this drug can sometimes do. So these are the summaries for the step trials. One, three, four, and step two. And you can see everywhere that the weight loss is substantial. However, I'd like to emphasize again, please read on right on top on the right. Semaglutide in any form is not marketed or available in India. Now, if you look at off-label use, you can use metformin, you can use the the the, the, the um Pramnitide and you can use the SGLT2 inhibitor, just empagliflozin, depagliflozin, and canagliflozin. And you know, a very good combination for weight loss in a diabetic patient would be metformin, a GLP-1 analog, and of course, an SGLT2 inhibitor. Just as an aside before I finish, you must understand that a human chorionic gonadotropin was first suggested as treatment for obesity in 1954 in a Lancet paper. It became popular in 1970s, and the current popularity is because of Dr. Kevin Sudhu's 2007 book, which said that the weight loss cure that they don't want you to know you about, and the miracle weight loss breakthrough. Very fortunately, the Federal Trade Commission ordered Mr. Trudeau to pay $37 million as damages for false claims with HCG. So, ladies and gentlemen, with obesity reduction, you can have an improved quality of life, a decrease in sleep apnea, an improvement in fertility, a decrease in gout, a reduction of blood pressure and diabetes, perhaps less cancers occurring, perhaps less coronary artery disease, and perhaps less gallstones. So, I think that we should definitely try and control obesity. Thank you very much, and I'm open. To any questions if you want. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Behram. That was a lovely presentation. And uh, I would like to congratulate you because we had questions coming in right the minute you started your presentation. So people have been very, very uh, zeal about it. So let me just read out the questions to you. Is that okay? Absolutely. All right. Okay. So the first question is from Dr. Uh, Jesh and he wants to know that how can childhood obesity be I managed? Think to the void, bro. Dr. Nati, can you hear him? No, I don't think. Uh, I think he got disconnected. So I think somebody will have to talk to him. Oh, we're in change. You have I to make them. Yeah. Sir, we had lost you in between the oh, Sir, we had sorry. lost you in between. Okay, no issues, no issues. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you need a behavioral change. You have to have a behavioral change as far as these kids are concerned. And I think we should avoid drugs in children because drugs are much later. If you can make them eat healthier, if you can make them exercise better, if you can give them better drug choices, what we call medical nutrition therapy. Yes, please understand that dietary foods, 
not they are not necessary today i was discussing with my fellow when i had my dance and he said sir this is very tasty and it's quite nutritious and it i mean it's 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 very good and i told her am i there uh, am i audible yeah and i told her i said yes that's what's important in medical nutrition therapy it doesn't mean that dietary food should be rubbish they should taste like cardboard they can be very interesting actually so sir when you are saying behavioral change is it the behavior of the child or behavior of the parents both 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 you see the normal indian tendency is mera mera bachcha kitna patla ho gaya usko khilao wo tagda hona chahiye you see fat unfortunately in india is equal to a healthy status which is wrong that is the mindset which needs to change next question unati uh yes sir. so the next question is basically a statement where the where someone is wanting to know that patient might be disappointed by the modest size of weight losses with medications so how can one convince that medications are only adjunct to lifestyle changes exercise and other treatments for weight loss look you have to be very realistic when you look at weight loss programs you cannot expect the weight loss to give you ad infinite reduction in weight you have to temper your expectation so if you make the patient understand that this is my goal and you have to reach it not only with your medication but along with your diet along with adjunctive therapy of exercise and your changes in your eating habits that is what makes a difference perhaps the only thing where you can lose 30% or 40 or 50% of your weight loss is when you go to dr raman goel right but that is something which is totally different correct makes sense so uh, dr seema uh, i would want you to unmute yourself and go ahead with any questions that you have hello yes ma'am yeah ma'am could you could you just turn on your camera as well she's muted oh no she's there yeah she's here Yeah. Uh, Are we audible? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Question for Doctor Padi Wala. Yeah. If I started with, uh, I've start uh, patient to early state. How how many months I can continue with it? You can continue up to two years, ma'am. The only thing is you have to understand that since it gets rid of the fat. you have to give fat soluble vitamins a d e a k so that as a supplementation you have to give and let me tell you that patients who respond to all this that complain of a lot of oily stool i remember one or two of my patients actually told me doctor we get loose motion so i he actually used to carry soap with him so if he had to use a public toilet he could wash himself it was that oily so that is something okay. that you must bear in mind okay for after how many uh, months um, days i should go for uh, uh, lft and uh, and serum creatinine done after for all this uh, that for all this that it's not essential that you can do an lft and a serum creatinine i think that is more for the other drugs the kismia and the the, the locazine all those that is those those drugs are the ones which give you problem they cause dehydration etc or this act is relatively safe because it just acts at the at the cilia of the intestines oh. okay thank you sir sure sir uh, can i can i ask you a question of course now uh, out of all these medicines that you have mentioned which one are really available in india you know so i am aware oh, of oh. Kismia yeah. is available. Kismia is available. Kismia is available. Yes, yes. You can get kismia. You can get liraglutide. Oh, you can get liraglutide. Is not available, sir. So, sorry. Fentanyl. Fentanyl is not available. Yeah. Yeah. But all the others are available. Sabaglutide will become available, I think, next week or ten days from now. Yeah, I am told the sabaglutide tablets are also coming to India. 
So this is oral semaglutide, which I showed you. Uh, semaglutide, when you use tablets, uh, unfortunately, they have to be given at a specific time, and the side effects are tremendous. Right? So a uh, lot of GI side effects. But if you tolerate the GI side effect, you know, you can almost go up to 25% weight loss. And not only that, Dr. Goy, see, this is, uh, you had, uh, you had the Victoza, the Lira glutide, then you had Dula glutide, now you have Tama glutide. Then you have Terophotide, which is Lily, which is going to come out in about two years time. And that, that actually, they jokingly said, will drive the bariatric surgeons out of business because you can get up to 50% weight loss, 50%, but you have a lot of GI side effect. Please understand what I'm telling you is not yet marketed in India, not yet approved in India. But since this is a scientific discussion, I'm bringing it forth. So, sir, when you say you have been very emphatic that these are not approved for India. So, except Orly stat, is Orly stat approved in India for weight loss? Uh, Doctor, Doctor Padiwala, we can't hear you. I think uh, there is some internet problem from me. Doctor Onnati, can you hear him? I think he's back, Doctor Raman. Doctor uh, Behram, are you with us? Can you hear us? I think his video got stuck. No issues. I think uh, Doctor Raman, we can start with yours. Meanwhile, I think he'll come back. Yeah. Okay. 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 Over, over to you, Dr. Raman. Thank you so much. All right. So, uh, friends, as Dr. Padiwala's internet, sir, you are back. Yeah, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Right. So, I, I'd like to correct one thing, Dr. Goel. Liraglutide is available in India. Dulaglutide is available in India. Kismia is available in India. They are Liraglutide and uh, dulaglutide are not approved for weight reduction, but off-label doctors do use it, right? That is the thing. They are basically anti-diabetic medications. So how safe is uh, uh, off-label use in India in a non-diabetic patient if you are using it for weight loss? How safe but, are medical legally? Uh, well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me get back to you with what once Dr. Pritam Patnani told us. He, he's a, he was a leading forensic expert, if you yeah. understand that. Yeah. And he told us, we were having a, our journal club, South Bombay Journal Club meeting. And over there, we questioned him about this. He said, all the doctors who are present in this meeting, you can use these drugs. The Supreme Court has said that medical progress cannot occur unless and until there are doctors who can push the envelope to find what they can do. However, such doctors should have enough experience of the drug, such doctors should have enough experience in practice, such doctors should do it openly with informed consent of the patients. And then the Supreme Court had said that the doctor is not at all liable. However, if you tell me that a junior doctor or a resident or a registrar, <coughs> or a junior, the team put himself open for Sir, I think there is some internet connectivity issue. From his end. Not on nothing. Yeah, I also feel the same. So. Was the question completed, Dr. Raman, or he was? Uh, still we can funny? take it afterwards if required. Yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah, we'll take it after your session then. Okay. So, uh, friends, uh, you know, after a wonderful talk from uh, Dr. Vairam Padiwala, who is a teacher of teachers, our mentor in Wakard Hospital, and we fall back on him for a lot of support for our bariatric patients. Uh, I uh, I wished it wanted to share with you. Uh, the management of medical problems after bariatric surgery. And uh, this is something, this is to uh, complement what Dr. Padiwala has already covered. And uh, besides that, how do you manage 
diabetes, how do you manage hypertension, how do you manage gout, and likewise. So uh, briefly, I'll show you a brief presentation, uh, just about five to seven minutes, and then we can take questions related to this and also what Dr. Pardiola was showing, uh, discussing. So, greetings on behalf of Center for Metabolic Surgery, which is at uh, Wokard Hospital. And, uh, and I'm going to talk about what the physicians should know about recommended medicines in bariatric patients. So, these are basically in three categories. The, the supplements that are typically given to, to any bariatric patient after surgery to ensure that they are nutritionally uh, well balanced because the meal size is very small. And uh, so this is, this is I'll, I'll just spend a few minutes. Weight loss medicines already Dr. Pardiwala has discussed in detail, so I'll not be covering that. And then how do you manage comorbidities after bariatric surgery because there are multiple issues involved. So, as far as supplements are concerned, why, why supplements are required after surgery? Basically, for these three reasons, that the, most of the population have pre-existing deficiencies. We know how almost 80% of Indian population has vitamin D deficiency. A very large percentage of population have vitamin B12 deficiency uh, and likewise. And generally, these are the deficiencies we check. We don't check for hundreds of them, you know, manganese, magnesium, selenium, zinc. So we presume if there are more than one deficiency that we find, that means person has multivitamin and multimineral deficiency, and all of them should be corrected as a broad umbrella. Then there is surgical impact. So if we do a surgery where we are operating only on a stomach, like a sleeve gastrectomy, then the supplement dose requirement is less because there is no malabsorption involved. But if you are doing a surgery which is a bypass, then certainly the, the requirement is higher. And third thing is diet related. There are people who are vegetarian, there are people who are vegan. And uh, after bariatric surgery, their requirements are different than let's say somebody who is taking a, a balanced diet who, which has enough protein in it and enough, enough calcium products in it. So we'll briefly talk about it, so give you an idea. So most of the time, pre-operative workup, besides routine tests that are done for a, any general surgery, we usually get their ferritin level done besides non-routine iron workup. We always get a B12, vitamin D3, and parathyroid hormone done, and we measure their serum proteins and uh, albumin globulin ratio. These are, these are important because this shows what kind of deficiencies they have. And if there are deficiencies and if patient has time, you know, they are local patients and they want to get a surgery done a month later or two months later, then we can start correction of these deficiencies well in advance before surgery. Many times it happens that patient just landed in Mumbai and we operate them. So we get these deficiencies assessed and we, uh, we do the correction accordingly. We, make, uh, we factor in that they already have deficiency and correct them. And these supplements basically involve two or three groups. One of the micronutrients, which are vitamins and minerals, and they are macronutrients like proteins, carbohydrates, and fat. So we are basically supplementing proteins. And then we give uh, bile salts to our patients. And I'll just show you why we do that. Now, bile salts are given because in any weight loss, it's not related to only bariatric. Any weight loss leads to processing of fat in the body. And there are free fatty acids which are processed in the liver. And there is increased cholesterol con concentration in the bile. So the bile becomes more lithogenic or it forms more stones with weight loss. And if we give them bile salts for six months, then this lithogenicity reduces to about 2%. That means if 100 patients are given this, only 2% are likely to form gallstones because of weight loss, and which is a substantial benefit. And uh, this, is, uh, this is required only for first six months. After six months, we get their ultrasound done. And if there are no uh, gallstones, we stop the bile salts. 
सो दिस इज हाउ यू मैनेज एंड दीज आर अड़सो डी ऑक्सीकोलिक एसिड सिक्स हंड्रेड मिलीग्राम गिव इन ट्वाइस डेली यूजली आफ्टर मील्स टू अवॉइड द गेस्ट्राइटिस then uh, this is discussed in detail uh, about endocrine impact i'll just show you one slide about it that after surgery uh, all patients have reduced insulin resistance and thus the body is producing less insulin so because pancreas get rest so uh, before surgery their insulin levels may be 20 24 30 70 and after surgery because the insulin resistance is less gradually the insulin requirement goes down and insulin production goes down and the pancreas is able to uh, 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 protect its reserve and then similarly there is a reduced ghrelin level ghrelin is secreted usually from proximal bowel especially stomach and thus the the patients after bariatric surgery have low hunger compared to a diet where the ghrelin level goes up and the person is hungry all the time uh, when they go on a diet and the third major endocrine impact is on the glp1 hormone which is secreted from the distal bowel let's say that is distal small bowel ileum and uh, distal jejunum and this is this all the physicians know this is responsible for better glycemic control there are many other hormones but i wanted to uh, make it compact and we can discuss them in question answers if you wish to now as far as medical management after surgery is concerned so if a person had diabetes before surgery and is uh, after surgery uh, the sugars are fluctuating in the initial one or two months then it's better to use biguanides and sulfonylureas and the reason is that if we continue to give them insulin the 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 normal glycemic level or euglycemic level takes time to be achieved while with this this is more experience based there are no studies done on this but this is what has been realized that these two drugs help then anti hypertensive medication should be continued after surgery and only a family physician or a physician should stop it under supervision most of the time we have realized that patients start having postural hypotension if they continue with the anti hypertensive for very long and this postural hypertension uh, can be can be reduced or avoided if the the anti hypertensive medication uh, is reduced or stopped by the physician so please watch out for postural hypertension in your patients and you can help them directly these are not hypoglycemia these are mostly uh, postural hypertension then we know that thyroid medications are generally not stopped after bariatric surgery but as the weight of the patient goes down the thyroxine requirement goes down and it's a good idea to monitor their tsh levels and as it goes down you can probably uh, reduce the thyroxine supplementation <coughs> sorry similarly for gout we avoid xyloric in these patients because we we do not want gas severe gastritis or other issues so it's a good idea to monitor their uric acid because we are supplementing them with proteins and uh, and to start febustat to control the uric acid levels and believe me uh, none of the patient requires protein to be stopped because after surgery we are replacing the proteins which they normally get from the diet so please don't stop proteins of bariatric patients uh, if the if the uh, uric acid levels are very high maybe you can reduce the quantity of protein for few days start febustat simultaneously and the moment it comes within the range of 6 or below uh, you can increase the protein and continue with febustat and once the the uric acid has come down substantially uh, you can stop the febustat so proteins are required and they should be given now uh, a controversial issue is a uh, lipid lowering uh, drugs like like uh, like uh, statins now post bariatric surgery it is known that cholesterol levels become normal triglyceride levels become normal but it takes at least one year and these are this is because of there is a processing going on so it's a good idea that we don't expose our patients to cardiac risk and it's a good idea to continue with the drugs that you are you are giving before the surgery for at least one year and generally one year later the cholesterol and triglycerides come 
within normal range and then you can uh, definitely and you should stop these uh, these drugs at that time one to one and a half year after surgery friends it's important and it's uh, to to remember that after bariatric surgery if a, a, a diabetic patient if they get an infection the sugars can go up so patient may tell you i had a bariatric surgery and i don't have diabetes but please ask them that did you have diabetes before surgery even if they are on, not on medication but if they have any pneumonia or urinary tract infection it's a good idea to start them on insulin check their blood sugar and similarly patients may have low blood sugar after bariatric surgery because all of them have excellent glycemic control so we need to keep a watch on that also please do not stop supplements of a bariatric patient so if they are admitted or have any other disease either give continue in a intravenous form or continue the oral supplements supplements are extremely important and it's a good idea not to change the supplements prescribed by a bariatric program because we are uh, able, our dietitian is able to identify the 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 supplement uh, rdas of various vitamins and minerals and give a supplement accordingly which are not the normal supplement these are bariatric supplements then for other uh, other analgesics other medication antibiotics usually 3 months after surgery they can be prescribed it's not necessary to avoid them but obviously combination analgesics should be avoided so that we don't have gastric uh, gastritis or gastric perforations whether other procedures other surgeries deliveries can be done after bariatric surgery certainly there is no limitation a lot of our patients who travel from overseas have a second surgery 7 days after bariatric surgery so any time after 7 days to a month later uh, people have like a knee replacement after bariatric surgery after one week so this is all possible and do not do not worry about this and uh, uh, this is a small word of uh, uh, caution for you now bariatric patients may get constipated because they are eating a very small meal and the the intestine absorbs most of the nutrition from there so there is hardly anything left to form the bulk so it's a good idea to offer them whole grains so it has some fibers vegetables and fruits but still the focus is on the protein so they really do not get enough so now giving them isab gold doesn't help because isab gold is a bulk former and it's very difficult to to be consumed by a, a bariatric patient so nowadays we have soluble fibers available i am sure you are aware of it like cremalex or nutrilite fiber which is which is transparent which mix in the water and it's it's so easy to drink and it doesn't stain in the stomach so it doesn't form a bulk there so it forms a bulk further down and the person is able to eat a bariatric diet after this a patient should be encouraged to continue regular exercises because that helps in uh, their constipation and if they are constipated do not hesitate to prescribe laxatives because usually constipations are there for about 3 to 6 months at the most and non habit forming uh, laxatives can certainly be used uh, uh, another thing that a uh, physician should know that there is a term called dysgeusia and dysosmia which are disorder of taste and smell so patients may complain that they they don't like rice or they don't like chicken or they don't like water or they don't like something it is a real problem it's not something been about 5 to 10% of bariatric patient not in all the patients there may be patients who have dysosmia that they have they find i smell of uh, let's say garlic beer uh, in the house uh, not acceptable which they were they were loving before or a smell of anything being cooked and uh, this is simply a matter of time it is not long lasting they are self limiting and uh, this is probably because of the ghrelin ghrelin affecting the olfactory hormones there is a study being done on this so it's a good idea to rule out deficiency of zinc copper and nickel which may contribute for this and usually avoiding these these uh, particular stimulus is enough for for about 1 to 3 months and then the person will be able to to consume them again uh, a quick word about what is a standard advice of supplementation after bariatric surgery so proteins about 1 g per kg of ideal weight uh, is enough 
multivitamins like one to two times daily depending on the on the which kind of multivitamin we are using calcium citrate calcium in citrate form or fumarate form with vitamin d uh, about 1000 mg of uh, calcium citrate a day vitamin b12 uh, in india we get the, the sublingual tablet very good they don't need injectable by vitamin b12 of 1500 microgram twice weekly is more than enough for sublingual tablet and similarly iron in a ferrous uh, sulfate form in sulfate form uh, is a ferrous sulfate form is better and similarly the bile salts as i mentioned 600 mg uh, twice daily for six months is enough and it's a good idea that these people are monitored for their vitamins and my macronutrients so so these are the tests which we usually advise them to get done at six months ultrasound is done only at six months not thereafter but other tests are done on an annual basis thereafter to make sure that they are uh, they are having no deficiencies and i tell you almost 19 percent of our patients have no deficiencies after bariatric surgery they all of them had deficiencies before surgery but their nutrient status improved after bariatric surgery so to give you a brief mnemonic Weapons of bariatric surgery with a different spelling is water, exercise, proteins, no snacking and supplements. It's very easy for patients to remember and you can tell them to follow this. So friends, surgery is not the end. It's a beginning of a weight loss journey, a beginning of a healthy journey for patients. And please uh, be a part of it so that your patients feel good about their health. So thank you so much. I'll be very happy to take questions from. Um, all the members and when Dr. Pardiwala and Dr. Seema Shivasta who is here about uh, these medicines. Thank you so much, Dr. Raman. That was a lovely presentation. So I would first read out the question to you from one of our, one of our viewers. Uh, so the question is that with post-operative reduction in food intake and intolerance for meat and dairy products, uh, it usually causes iron deficiency anemia. So what should one try to do to try maintain the iron levels? And what are the best uh, tests for detecting the iron deficiency? Yeah, so iron deficiency is an, definitely an issue. And as many of the uh, patients, especially women in India, already have uh, pre-existing iron deficiency anemia, it is even a bigger challenge in India. And uh, so most of the patients are, are uh, prescribed, especially the bypass patients are prescribed ferrous sulfate. Uh, on a regular basis and we monitor their iron and hemoglobin levels uh, uh, we have found ferritin to be more reliable indicator uh, than the than other other uh, uh, tests and uh, if we find that the there is indeed an iron deficiency uh, which is not getting corrected we give them I iv iron once in 6 months and that uh, that keeps the reserve levels uh, high up and uh, at the same time, uh, they are also prescribed oral tablets. So it's a combination depending on the on the demand of the patient. So a woman during the uh, menstrual age probably require uh, IV uh, IV iron uh, 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 if they had a bypass. But if they had a sleeve, they, uh, the oral tablets are enough. So it's a more of an individualized approach based on their requirements. Thank you, Dr. Raman. So there's one more question, something related to that. So how should one tackle the issue of post-op reduction in bone mineral density? Okay. I think that's a great question because bone mineral density can indeed go down, especially in, uh, in bypass patients. And that is why we, we are so particular about calcium supplementation, about vitamin D supplementation, and we encourage them to exercise. So exercise is an is a important component of maintaining, uh, maintaining the, the, the bone uh, architecture, and especially in, uh, in more senior people. So I think all the three, and uh, it's a good thing nowadays, everybody says that Vitamin D level should be around 60, not, uh, you know, just keeping it around 30 is not enough. So 
we like to give them injectable vitamin D besides oral supplementation. And so once in six months, so when we check their vitamin D3 level, and if it's low, we give injectable vitamin D3 and we continue with the oral supplementation. And most of the patients are able to maintain this between 30 to 60 uh, with this kind of approach. Uh, and it's important to remember, Dr. Unnati, these people have come to us uh, before surgery with vitamin D levels of 9 or 10 or 13 or 18 or 20. Most of them are below 30. So if the patients are able to maintain above 30 and uh, the, the bone uh, 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 architecture is maintained much better. All right. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Raman. So, Dr. Behram, Dr. Seema, do you have any questions for Dr. Raman? Dr. Raman, one question. Uh, do you recommend different surgeries for weight loss and different surgeries for diabetes? Yeah. So, sir, initially it was thought that we have uh, different... Uh, procedures we need to devise different procedures for uh, diabetes but the procedures which were devised for diabetes were like ileal transposition i also started doing that very early in 2008 at bombay hospital i was there and we published our data in 2011 uh, they are quite complex surgeries and uh, what happened in the in the meantime the Cutoffs were reduced by International Diabetes Federation. At that time, we were not allowed to do these surgeries below 35 BMI. Now we are allowed to do standard procedures at 27.5 BMI. That means if somebody is like 10 kg overweight and is diabetic, we can offer a regular surgery. So I don't think we need to do uh, the, the novel surgeries for them. We can offer them gastric bypass or a sleeve gastrectomy, uh, which gives equally good result which are more standard procedures and they do not lead to excessive weight loss. Somehow the body has this homeostatic principle that if we do it at 28 BMI, they will probably come down to, they will lose 7, 8, 10 kgs or they will come down to 25 BMI and they will stop. So I, it's extremely rare to find somebody who has lost more than 100% of their extra weight. So the excessive weight loss fears are not, not there. And these surgeries give, both, both the surgeries give almost equally good result in an average diabetic. But if somebody is diabetic for a longer duration, if somebody is on insulin for longer duration, I would prefer a gastric bypass for sure. But if somebody is diabetic for two, three years, five years, not on insulin, sleeve gastrectomy gives equally good results. Dr. Unati? Yeah, all right, sir. I, you, I had lost you for a second. Uh, Dr. Seema, are you there with us? Do you have any questions? So maybe you can take run the video of the patient, Dr. Unati, and then we can, she can ask the question. That also works okay. Yeah. So push pendu, can we have uh, the Dr. patient? Seema is there you? now. You can she can probably ask. Okay, sure, sure, please. Do Dr. Seema, anything for the bariatric surgeon? You can't hear her. At least I can't hear her. So there seems to be an audio problem, uh, Dr. Raman. So do you want to go with the patient's video first? Okay. I mean, if Dr. Seema is comfortable with that. All right. So Dr. Nati, just start the video. Yeah. Sure, sure. Hello. Hi. I'm Ilan Farolia. I'm 60 years of age. And at the age of 52, I was very much depressed. Sure. And I had hypertension, I had diabetes, I had lots of problems. And as I'm shocked, 
it was really very bad for me to move on and one fine day i heard about dr raman goel and i went to him with my husband and he explained us everything and on that very same moment i told my husband i want to go in for the surgery and just in a day's time i took my decision and then i went for sleep gastronomy operation uh that was in the year 1914 i uh, tried sorry 2014 and now it is nearly 6 7 years after the baby at the top and i was really very much depressed when i was having this hypertension diabetes i was not going out you know i was never into the uh, i mean not the person to go out to enjoy myself and after the bediatric i really went and i improved it so i got my life again i would like to congratulate you hila uh, for your uh, surgery you. and that it went well and that your lifestyle has improved it is great to know and we are very happy to have you on board and thank you again for coming out and sharing your experience so i just have a couple of questions for you uh, yes, so before gastric uh, so like you told that you went and visited the uh, doctor and but what yeah. was the motivating factor what told you that okay you have to go for this did you try any uh, weight loss oh method? my god of course of course yes yes yeah, please I please tell so us that experience things. like uh, uh uh many many expensive medicines i took you know just to reduce then i went to gym. i joined the gym and very expensive gyms i joined and i used to reduce by 7 kilos and then as soon as i stopped it again shooted up you know my weight shooted up and it was like uh, i just read uh, dr raman goel's article in the paper that was the thing you know and it was a friday and just i called up and he has just left and then you know they told me that you will have to wait till tuesday so i was you know like waiting 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 till tuesday and then i got to see him i was with him for 3 4 hours and then i made my mind that i want to do it so i did great to know that and uh, so how has your journey been post during the bariatric surgery and post bariatric oh, oh yeah 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 see i basically i was in i am a catering person i have my own restaurant just now but before that i used to cater from my house okay i used to cater 150 tiffins you know but after getting all this i had left it now after the bariatric in a years time i got a restaurant over here in udwada which is in gujarat and i am really doing it very well my son is also there with me and now everybody is like illa 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 well, nobody was asking for illa you know it was like that. great to see that enthusiasm and great to see that you have you know done so well after the surgery so just wanted to know that yeah, yeah. Now, so now i just put my hand on any clothes and i get it you know it's like wow, that of amazing. course i had to go to my stores you know amazing amazing so i just wanted to know that how did all of this affect you psychologically how did you deal with it and what were the major lifestyle changes you had to adopt okay now see when i was fat i should say i was fat definitely i was fat so i was into very much depression i was never going for outing no parties nothing i you know i used to sit in the house i never used to like i never used to eat also you know that i was so much into depression and after the operation my lifestyle has really changed you know that i just have a small quantity of my portion still i do it i still take one roti only for my food or uh, a bowl of rice and dal and curd and lots of salads i'm having i have my chicken mutton fish also but in a very moderate manner i eat sweets also i have a very bad sweet tooth so i have it but in a very small quantity you know
so glad to know that uh, you adopted all these changes and uh, again thank you so much for coming out and sharing yeah, this all all credit goes to dr goel and his team great all great, credit great goes to dr goel and his team I, and i, I hope I your swear, testimony i still Yeah. Great, great to know that, Miss Ella. And I hope your testimonial is going to inspire a lot, many other people, and a lot of our family thank foundation. You, thank you so and much. And inspire and other really, people. Yeah, I'm really thank great you. that you uh, called me on the Zoom, and I'm really pleased to, you know. Thank I'm you so really much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for taking out okay. the time, and I think thank you for for thank being you, here. Yeah. Yeah, Doctor Nathi. So uh, congratulations, uh, Doctor Raman. Thank yeah, you. Thank she you. was very happy to share her experience, and I think the credit goes to you. Sir, you are saying something. I think it should go to one of them. We should go together, sir. She, she has a she has a restaurant there, and she has been inviting us for a very long time. And the reason why we are calling a patient in a in a Our CME is uh, our physicians, family physicians see them when they refer them for surgeries, but they don't get to see the human side side of their recovery. They see the sugars have improved, blood pressure has improved, but they don't realize how it is affecting them as an individual, how it's affecting their interpersonal life, relationships, their their productivity, which is outside the clinic. So if somebody who is a doctor would Party wala, doctor party wala will check the blood sugar, blood pressure, and will say, "Okay, you are doing well." But how the person is doing at home is so important to us, all of us, ultimately. Yeah. So uh, yes, doctor Nadi. Doctor Bairam, do you have something to add? Do you want to say something? No. <laughs> okay, then I think uh, we have had a beautiful session today by both Doctor Bairam and Doctor Raman, and uh, the patient's testimonial. only added value to the entire program so i would like to thank both of you yes dr raman please so before you close uh, i would like to thank uh, uh, dr padiwala sir uh, for his presence and time it's so difficult to get a appointment for a patient for 15 to 20 days with him i mean sir uh, calling him for a cme you know though i am able to manage the consultations always for my patients with him and so thank you so much sir he is not only my patient's uh, physician he treats my entire family and my personal physician so I, it's an honor to have him around and uh, Same, sir. a, a person with a very broad outlook so when you send a patient to him he looks at hol holistically so it's not a question of a particular disease and every patient comes very happy you know once he goes to them they always say thank you for sending us to a to the right person so thank you sir once again for joining and thanks hila for uh, such wonderful testimonial and your exp sharing your experiences it takes real effort to talk openly about their own health problems on a on a public platform so thank you so much and thanks dr unnati please go ahead thank you sir thank you dr bairam it was lovely having you here we would look forward to hear from you again soon uh, we will get back and dr raman thank you for organizing this program so and i would like to thank all our viewers who are with us please drop many questions we will get back to you with the answers and i will see you all next thursday with another episode of this stay till then please stay safe stay connected happy doctor lecture thank you everyone thank you, thank you.